if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Thank you for joining me today, and thank you to the George C. Marshall Foundation for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, our subject today is the Christmas Truce of 1914, and I hope this is of interest for you. Um, the Christmas Truce of 1914, 108 years on, still resonates with people today. And in fact, I would suggest its, it's, it's, its symbolism is almost growing uh, um, as the years go by. Um, um, and we shall look at why that was, or why that is, and, and more importantly, how what led to the truce and how it started. Uh, what happened during the truce and then how the truce came up came to an end because this of course is just just one day in the, in the whole of the first world war and yet it's something that's become one of the main events of the war itself in the eyes of many people um the first world war um as we know started in august 1914 and, and was characterized in the early periods by what became known as the race to the sea or the race to the coast with the allied and and german armies fighting a battle a moving battle uh to the Belgian coastline. By the time they reached Christmas uh, 1914, it was a static war um, with the armies entrenched along uh, battle lines drawn from the coast to, uh, to the Swiss border. Um, these trenches were not very sophisticated at the period in time. Some were little more than just ditches. Um, they were just where people had ended up uh, as the battle had, had progressed along the line. Um, the British sector of the of, of, of the uh, of the front at that point was only around twenty miles, um, spanning the the Franco-Belgian border, and the conditions were grim. Um, by winter of nineteen fourteen, um, the areas were flooded. Um, it was the the, the, it was the first winter of the war. It was it was cold. It was the first time away from home for many people, and the first major confrontation of the war had taken place between October and November with the first Battle of Ypres, which brought about around a quarter of a million casualties. These are the sort of factors that lay the seeds for, for the truce um, that would happen at the Christmas time. As we got closer to Christmas, um, the idea of, of, that there would be an official formal truce was, was uh, something that was raised by Pope Benedict XV um, and was an idea that was rejected by both sides, but has certainly taken up as a theme by the press and was widely talked about. And I'd suggest this puts the idea of, of a Christmas truce into the minds of the soldiers themselves, the possibility of a ceasefire taking place. Um, the soldiers would have been well aware of what was going on in the wider world away from the battlefront. Um, newspapers were delivered to the front. There was a, by Christmas of 1914, there was a very big mail organisation providing posts on a daily basis to, to, the, to the soldiers at the front line. Um, by I think by the time Christmas arrived, they were handling something around a quarter of a million packages and parcels every day. Um, the soldiers would have been receiving cards, receiving gifts, receiving food. So this creates an environment in which Christmas is very much in their thoughts, is, is very prevalent. Many For many of the soldiers, it would be the first time they'd even been away from home for Christmas. Um, so the idea of Christmas time was not something that was at the back of their minds, but would have been at the, very much the fourth into their minds. Um, one of the other reasons that, that that we might have an environment where the truce was uh, comes about was a practical reason. Um, the winter weather made for the poor conditions and the conditions that they were living in. So as I mentioned before, the trenches were not as very sophisticated as yet. There was some um, devices for, for removing the flooding from the water, but uh, some pumps. But um, quite often soldiers were, were living in conditions where they'd be up to their knees or higher in, in water. As, as, as December progressed, there was a major offensive um, of December the 18th and 19th, um, which saw hundreds of men, mainly from the Scottish regiments, um, killed. Uh, in, and for those who were in the trenches on both sides, as German soldiers killed, of course, in the offensive, they were watching over a no man's land that sometimes was as little as 50 yards apart between the trenches. Uh, the trenches. Uh, and that no man's land, there would have been vis very visible, uh, the, dead, the dead soldiers in front of them. So how does the truce itself start? Well, it's important to know that the, the, the Christmas truce is not one truce, but a series of truces along about two thirds of that 20 mile stretch. Um, not every battalion, not every regiment took part um, in the truce. 
and actually it was sort of characterized more often by British British forces where they're opposite Saxon forces rather than some of the other uh, German um, regiments that were along the along the German front. Each started in different ways and each lasted lasted from different time periods. Some was just a few hours, some some lasted a few days and some for longer. Um, and as a common attribution to the Germans having started the crew, the, the, the truce. Now, this may be because the British soldiers didn't want to be seen to be the ones sort of putting down their weapons first. Um, although there was clearly a, a zest to do so once once the uh, common enthusiasm, once that had, uh, once that had happened. Um, but the first truce had actually taken place a few days earlier. The, the battles of, of December 18th and 19th had left wounded on the battlefield. And in certainly in one area, um, um, approaches are made between between the sides to recover the wounded um, and to bury the bodies. Uh, and this, again, set a tone that would be capitalised on at Christmas. The idea of, of a Christmas truce, there had already been a smaller truce in the days running up to Christmas. But the main overtures for Christmas to, to start on Christmas Eve, um, the German uh, the German army had been sent Christmas trees um, up to the front line to, to, to sort of raise the spirits of their soldiers. And these started to appear along the parapet in various places with candles and Chinese lanterns and such like. And as the sun set on Christmas Eve, in several places along the line, um, carol singing took place in the German trenches in some places accompanied by bands, musical bands, um, and you know, many of the British soldiers noted that this was taking place and they sat and listened to what was going on and cheered. Um, and then there was reports of German soldiers shouting back, you know, encouraging the British soldiers to, to reply in song. Um, and in several places along the Reston Front, there was singing back and forth between the two, the two lines on Christmas Eve. If, you do, if I may, I've got a letter here which illustrates what I'm talking about. This is a letter from Sergeant Lovell of the Rifle Brigade goes back to his parents in England. Christmas Day, the most wonderful day on record. In the early hours of the morning, the events of last night appeared as some weird dream, but today, when well, it beggars description, you'll hardly credit what I'm going to tell you, but thousands of our men will be writing home today telling the same strange and wonderful story. Listen, last night as I sat in my little dugout writing, my chum came bursting in with me. Hark at them, and I listened. From the German trenches came the sound of music and singing. My chum continued, they've got Christmas trees all along the top of their trenches. Never saw such a sight. I got up to investigate. Climbing the parapet, I saw a sight which I shall remember to my dying day. Right along the whole of their line were hung paper lanterns and illuminations of every description. Many of them in such positions that suggest that they were hung upon Christmas trees. And as I stood in wonder, a rousing song came over to us. At first the words were indistinguishable. Then as the song was repeated out again and again, we realised we were listening to the watch on the Rhine. Our boys entered with a cheer, while a neighbouring regiment sang lustily the national anthem. Some were shooting the lights away, but almost at first shot there came a shout in really good English, stop shooting. Then began a series of answering shots from trench to trench, answering shouts from trench to trench. It was incredible. Hello, hello, you English, we wish to speak. And everyone began to speak at once. So that gives you an example of, of, of the mood on the uh, on Christmas Eve. And the, this this was repeated throughout the evening until the early hours of the morning. And many soldiers report going to bed at that night, at night, going to sleep at night, wondering just what the following morning would bring. So the first overtures were made on Christmas Eve. The word quickly got round along the, the British line, just what had happened. Remarkable events, really. Um, and the sun rose, the first sort of shouting started to take place across between the two lines, sort of picking up uh, the mood of the evening before, um, inviting one another to come out. Now, and certainly in some places, you know, this was just greeted with, uh, this was ignored, if you like, um, and, and the fighting continued. But in one or two places, typically one or two people would venture out from each side uh, and across to meet each other, watched by everybody else uh, to see what would happen. And agreeing terms on a ceasefire. Now, these terms would would, would be largely built around getting out to recover body, recover the bodies of the fallen of the previous week's battles. Although some had been out there since the uh, the, ba the Battle of Ypres uh, the previous month. I've got a letter here from a Corporal John Ferguson, the Seaforth Highlanders. 
who explains a little more how that how this of what, what happened in the morning. All of a sudden, someone calls from the German trenches. Comrade, English comrade. I answered him. Hello, Fritz. We call him Fritz. Do you want any tobacco? He asks. Yes, I answer. Then he says, come half ways. We shout backward and forward until old Fritz clambers out of the trench and comes towards us. Accompanied by one of my, by, by other three of my section, we go out to meet him. Fancier, we were walking between the trenches, which at any other time would have meant suicide. Even to show one's head above the parapet would have been fatal. But tonight we go unharmed, although a wee bit shaky, out to meet our enemies. Make for the light, he calls, and as we go nearer, we see his flash lamp in his hand, putting it in and out to guide us. When we meet, we shake hands and wish each other Merry Christmas, and are soon conversing as if we'd known each other for years. And this is typical of the sort of first, first moments of the truce. Um, opposite soldiers from opposite sides shaking hands and, and chatting. There's um, a lot of the soldiers of the German soldiers could speak English and speak English well. And it transpires that many have lived in England and worked in England. And these sort of gave them common ground for conversation. They knew different places, they knew different football teams. Um, in one or two places, they even knew the same people, which is quite, quite something. Um, being Christmas, they came to exchanging gifts between the two sides, typically um, English, British cigarettes for, for German cigars, uh, coins, bullets, even cutting but buttons off each other's jackets as souvenirs. They shared food and drink, although certainly there was some caution around uh, the sharing of food and drink, not trusting whether people would be poisoning each other. Um, so inviting each other to take a swig or a bite first. Um, they continued the singing from the nights before. There's, there's instances of people dancing together, of playing games and swapping addresses and agreeing to meet up after the war. Um, quite remarkable events and circumstances. But one of the key drivers of the, of, of the truces along the front was a burial of, of, uh, of fallen comrades. Um, and memorably, one of these took place at a place called Fleur Bay. I have a letter here from a Lance Corporal Alexander Imler of the Gordon, Highland, Gordon Highlanders. This explains a little of what, of what happened in, one, in just one area. The German officers then said that they wished an armistice in order to bury their dead. After some conference, it was agreed to grant the armistice, the reason being that we had, to had dead to bury. Other sentiments had also something to do with it, I think, for was it not Christmas Day, the day of peace and goodwill towards men? We were all glad of the halt anyway, and soon we got started burying the dead. Any of our men who were lying near the German trenches were carried to the Germans, by the Germans to a ditch midway between the trenches where they were buried by us. Any of their dead on our side of the ditch were carried there to be taken away by the Germans for burial. Our padre, who very fortunately happened to come up to the trenches that morning to wish us a Merry Christmas, arranged to have a service. After the burials were completed, we lined up on opposite sides of the ditch, officers in front and burial parties to the rear. I was very proud to be one of our party on such an occasion. Our padre then gave a short service one of the items in which was a Psalm 23. Thereafter, a German soldier, a divinity student, I believe, interpreted the service to the German party. I could not understand what he was saying, but it was beautiful listen to, to, to listen to him. He had such an expressive voice. The service over, we were soon fraternizing with the Germans as if they were old friends. We've all heard of the terrible atrocities per 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 perpetrated by the Germans, but really from our intercourse with some of them on Christmas day, one could hardly believe and capable of the terrible acts that they that would be laid at their door. Aside from the general fraternization, plenty of curious, more curious things took place on that day. There's this, the stories of a German soldier cutting a British soldier's hair. There's stories of soldiers chasing hares around and dressing up in fancy dress. And in one place, they even exchanged barrels of beer. There was two breweries behind the German line, and they rolled the barrels out for the Welsh Fusiliers to drink. And there were the reports that came back afterwards that the beer might not have been at the best, the best state of its life. One of the questions that, that always comes up when people consider the Christmas truce is, did they play soccer? Well, certainly it was talked about um, a lot. A lot of the Germans who lived in England would have had their own soccer teams and wanted the news of how they were getting on. Um, and certainly there was the opportunity to play a game between themselves was talked about a lot. In several places along the line, plans were made for a game to take place the following day. 
or the following week on New Year's Eve. Um, and there seemed to be quite a bit of excitement about the prospect of having a soccer match between the Germans and the and the Scottish in one case and the English in another. Um, but actual first-hand accounts of, of soccer matches taking place are quite quite thin on the ground. Um, the likelihood is that if, the, if football took place, or soccer, as, as we call it over here, as you call it over Certainly, the likelihood is if soccer did take place, it wasn't in, as we would know it and, and understand it with goals, referees, and so on. Um, it's more likely people kicking around, um, whatever the, would be at hand to kick around, whether that be sort of empty tins or you know makeshift footballs. I think there's instances of people creating balls out of out of caps stuffed with straw and that sort of thing. So not soccer necessarily as we know it, but I think one of the key things to think about in the Christmas truce is that as well as an opportunity to, to, to meet the enemy, to, to shake hands, to look the people in the face that perhaps you hadn't even seen before. This was also an opportunity to literally just stretch your legs and not worry about getting sniped at, not worried about getting 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 shot. Um, a, a chance to walk, move around in safety. Um, people who maybe have been crawling around or walking around on, the, on, on their knees uh, for, for days at a time. So the chance to stretch your legs to move and run about, it's almost a, a natural progression to, to start kicking things and, and have an impromptu game taking place. And there are secondhand reports of football matches taking place, soccer matches taking place. Um, there's, a, there's a suggestion that one, one game finished 3-2. There's a suggestion of, uh, of, of, of another game as well, which I think was 2-1 from memory. One of the other curious things that took place to me on the, uh, throughout, throughout the Christmas truce was the taking of photographs of, of, uh, of men from both sides lined up together. I think when we think about the exchange of gifts and souvenirs, it, it, it's almost a natural extension of that for uh, to think that um, people might want to have the photographs taken together. Uh, during the first months of, of, the, of the war, when the, when the soldiers headed out there, it, for many it was it was a, it was almost an adventure. And there would it was quite it was not uncommon for soldiers to pack what was known as the soldier's Kodak as the first small portable camera in their bags to take with them. And by November, the first photographs of the battles uh, taken from the battle battlefront uh, for, uh, started to appear in, in newspapers back in uh, back in Britain. So the um, the powers that be had moved quickly to ban um, uh, battlefield photography. But the temptation was such. Um, under such extraordinary circumstances that, that people did take photographs. And there's a small number of those photographs do still exist today. Um, I think one of the proudest things for me in producing the book was, was a number of these photos that I managed to sort of unearth, some of which hadn't been shown for a while. What I think might be interesting now is if I can share some of those photographs with you and tell you a little bit about the photos, pictures behind them. You just bear with me. This first photograph is one of the most famous photographs of the First World War in total, never mind of the Christmas truce. The English soldier to the left of the German with a cigarette is Private Malcolm Grigg, who served with the London Rifle Brigade. He wrote after the, of the truce, I raked up some of my rusty German and chatted with some of them. Some of them seemed to have no personal animosity against England and said they would be jolly glad when the war was over. Sadly for Grigg, he was killed 19 months later in the Battle of the Somme when he was just 22 years old. This photograph shows Scottish and German soldiers posing side by side and was taken by Lieutenant Alan Swinton on Christmas Day, 1914, in what is a frosty no man's land. It almost certainly features a Captain Sir Edward Hulse who wrote of the truce. I hope to be able to send your photograph of us and the Germans together on Christmas Day. Swinton took, from, took them with a little pocket camera and the Padre has taken the films home to get them developed. If the negative comes out, it'll be a unique incident, well recorded. Alas, Hulse may never have seen the photograph as he too was killed three months after the Christmas truce. He was trying to rescue an injured officer from the battlefield. He was just 25 years of age. This third photograph doesn't show the Christmas truce. This, this shows some of the Scottish officers on Christmas Day enjoying Christmas dinner in a French farmhouse. The farmer's daughter can be seen at the back. Earlier on, they'd held a communion service in a barn and played football with a group of French youths. Um, and after their food, which we're told was two bottles of wine, um, included two bottles of wine, they went to the front line to investigate the truce and met a group of German soldiers. The picture belongs to Captain John Stansfield, who's pictured on the left, and he wrote, 
One man made a horrible face and slunk off like a frightened wolf and started to run to the trench. I honestly thought he was going to get his gun and shoot me. Presently, he came back with four pals and shouted to me to go back and photograph them. Stansfield himself was killed nine months later in the opening exchanges of the Battle of Luz, and he was 35. Again, I like this photograph. It was taken on Christmas Day, 1914, on the Western Front, and features a Captain Thomas McClellan playing the bagpipes in the trenches to entertain his men. I could just imagine the sound of the bagpipes airing out across the battlefield. And at the same time, Frank Naden of the Cheshire Regiment, who was about five miles away, rose. The Germans gave us some of their sausages, and we gave them some of our food. The Scotsman then started the bagpipes, and we had a rare old jollification, which included football, in which the Germans took part. The Germans said they were tired of the war and wished it was over. McClellan there, who's pitched with the bagpipes, it belonged to the 1st Battalion of the Cameronians, and they actually ignored overtures made by the Germans to shake hands on Christmas Day, such was their anger at having lost so many men to sniper fire in the previous weeks of the war. And this is a nice picture for anyone who likes to walk their dog on Christmas Day. The chap with the Christmas decorations around his neck is Private Hugh Coughlin of the 1st Battalion of the Cameronians, walking a dog in the trenches outside Armentier on Christmas Day 1914. I think it's quite a curious picture. But what's, what's notable about it is that they're all standing up straight. Uh, there's no fear and no worry about snipers. And although they themselves didn't take part in the truce, they, didn't, they, they spent the day in peace. So the Christmas truce itself has been afforded a great symbolism over the years uh, and a great Christian symbolism. Um, I think one of the letters we referred to earlier mentioned peace and goodwill amongst amongst men. And I think that's true. And I think for, for many of the, 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 the soldiers on both sides, there was a there was certainly an air of Christmas spirit around the place. But it was also a moment of pure excitement and relief and curiosity, because as I mentioned before, in some cases, they'd not even seen each other, um, such was the, uh, the nature of the battle at that point and, uh, and the danger of putting your head above the, um, the parapet. But there was also the practical aspect as well of the truth of gathering in the, the dead, the chance to stretch the legs and safety and put the head up for the first time in months. But also as an opportunity to fix the trenches themselves, to collect firewood and just generally make their lives more comfortable for when the war was inevitably started again. Um, as previously mentioned, there was not truces everywhere, and not, as there was still fighting taking place along one third of the line. Um, if you look at the Commonwealth War Grave Commission records, it suggests that 43 people were killed in action on December the 25th itself. Um, but where, the, where the truces did take place, it was most likely with the Saxon regiments, and it's commented quite often, uh, but mainly by German soldiers, actually, that... Um, there is there is that kindred spirit between the, the English Anglo-Saxons and the, the Saxons of Germany, which is not shared by some of the other German regiments. Um, the, the truce itself lasted in some places just for a few hours, in some days, in some cases for days, in some cases for longer. Um, there's, there's, there's examples of the truce running over into the new year in at least one place. And quite commonly, it, it, it ended when the, the battalions changed and went to billets for rest. Um, so you no longer had the men who'd met each other facing off against each other. With the uh, with all that brings. So when the truce was was brought to us, uh, an end, in some cases it was typically because they'd set out with a begin with an agreed time scale from the beginning, um, and said, you know, we'll we'll meet, we'll spend today in peace, or we'll spend today and tomorrow in peace. Um, but typically, it lasted from Christmas Day Eve to, bo to Boxing Day, with let's say one or two places stretching on to New Year's Day. Um, okay. Interestingly, amongst the conversations that people had had, there was there was a agreements to once the war did resume that they should shoot high so as not to kill each other, um, but also that the, the war should resume at an agreed moment, and uh, with with a gunshot um, in the air, uh, sounding uh, symbolising the um, resumption of hostilities. I have a letter here that explains a little more. This is from William Code of the East Lancashire Regiment. We had a very nice day. In the evening, we had the order to go back to our trenches. But before we went back, they said to us, if you don't shoot, we don't shoot. If you shoot high, we will understand and shoot high too. From then until New Year's Eve, there was hardly a single casualty on either side in our immediate neighbourhood, though, of course, we were firing off and on. But on New Year's Eve, the Saxons were again relieved by the Prussians. And as we had received warning of this in the shape of a few shells, we reverted to the style of fighting of a month or so before and were at it as hard as ever. The soldiers themselves were, were very much aware um, 
of the sense of history that was being created in the moment. There's, 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 uh, I think there's reference in one of the previous letters to to uh, a photograph recording a moment that uh, would go down in history, and I think plenty that were aware that that was the case. I have a letter here that uh, touches on that. This is from a uh, rifleman Georgie to the Rifle Brigade. I was talking to a German bombardier yesterday afternoon. He lived in London some time and could speak good English. His parting words were, today we have peace. Tomorrow you fight for your country. I fight for mine. Good luck. And back he went. I shouldn't be surprised if he was one of the gunners shelling us this morning. Such is war. I had a cigar after dinner yesterday, given me by a German officer to whom I gave some cigarettes. And found out later the cigarettes were called Kitchener's. Funny that, wasn't it? People in England will never believe it, I'm sure. Even to us, it seems unreal. And I think many of the soldiers were, were aware of that sense that people back home wouldn't believe them. But I th what's, what's interesting to me is the volume of letters come home expressing similar sentiments and similar experiences. And I think the, 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 these early letters back from the Western Front are the true sort of uh, description of what happened, if you like. Um, as time went by, by in the months past and, and soldiers would come home uh, on leave or, or for medical recuperation, stories were getting embellished and stories were getting added to. And I think that's one of the reasons why football becomes such, such a thing, because people ask the football question um, or the soccer question, sorry. Um, and soccer was, was was something that people started saying they'd played and seen and taken part in that perhaps wasn't as prevalent in the in the early correspondence back home. Um, the aftermath of, of the Christmas truce was was met with horror by the uh, by the, the generals on both sides who issued an edict saying that it must never happen again. But the circumstances of the war as it progressed through 1915 made it less likely um, in itself anyway. I think one of the, the, the truths of Christmas 1914 is that the men on each side didn't have the hatred toward each other that they, they did later on in the war. Um, and particularly after the first gas attacks of the spring 1915, when there was a real sort of sea change in the way they saw each other um, uh, on, on each side and the, and the, the casualties they covered, uh, they caused and the suffering. However, there was a small, a smaller truce that did take place in 1915 and, and reports of a further one in 1916. Well, I hope that's been of interest. Um, if anyone is interested in finding out any more, please please get in touch with me and I'm happy to help anyone in any which way we can. And if anyone interested in the book, it's called the Christmas Truce by the Men Who Took Part and contains the largest number of first-hand accounts of the truce and probably the largest collection of photographs as well. So that's available too. Um, thank you once again to the George C. Marshall Foundation for giving me this opportunity and a Merry Christmas to everybody and a happy and healthy New Year to you all.